Hi and welcome to this MPTL course titled Trauma and Literature. We're looking at Joseph Heller's novel Catch-22. We will start with a separate section today, chapter 18. So as you can see, even the way we are reading this novel is non-chronological in quality because, you know, we're making jump cuts across different chapters uh, because in a way it does justice to the representational politics of the novel, which is quite postmodern in quality. Uh, because even the novel is not chronological, it has different jump cuts, different plays, interplay of space and time across different vectors. So it does make sense and does uh, <clears throat> have a lot of rationale and justification. Uh, in a way, it's also a tribute to the aesthetics of the novel if we study it non-chronologically. Right? So up to chapter 27, which we did last session, we come back to chapter 18. And we see how uh, the philosophical sequence of the novel is different from the narrative sequence, which makes the novel, again, uh, very, very postmodernist as well as uh, cognitively unsettling. Now, the title of this chapter is A Soldier Who Saw Everything Twice. This is chapter 18, uh, which should be on the screen. Uh, and the very title uh, suggests some degree of cognitive dissonance, uh, some degree of cognitive confusion, uh, which is supposed to be shocking, uh, cognitively shocking in quality. And of course, it's reflective of a very serious medical condition. By the way, in which these issues get represented in a novel, we find that it has a tragic comic quality which makes uh, the tragedy or, or the tra uh, the trauma quotient even more disturbing because there's no, there's no tragedy in trauma. Uh, it just becomes a flattened discourse, it just becomes uh, a regular ritual in the normative condition, right? So in trauma becomes a normative condition, you almost begin to make, uh, you know, produce comicality out of it or generate laughter out of it, which makes it even more uh, cold and complex uh, uh, existentially as well as uh, medically. Now, uh, as you can see, it starts with a paradox. Again, the very first line, the very first opening sentence of this section, uh, it starts with another uh, funny epigrammatic uh, paradox. Epigram uh, or epigrammatic means something which is intended to shock, right? So epigrammatic wit is shocking wit. So you put things together which are not supposed to be together. And that's how you produce uh, paradoxes as well. So what's the rain? Uh, uh, and this should be on the screen, was the rain orders good health to exercise, fresh air, teamwork and good sportsmanship. It was a getaway from all them, uh, from them all that he had first discovered the hospital, right? So again, uh, as you can see, the first part of the sentence makes a lot of sense logically and um, commonsensically and the next part of the sentence completely deconstructs or undercuts it and that's how uh, we have the production of paradox, undercutting one sentence, undercutting uh, one half of the sentence undercutting the other half with uh, a counter logic, a counter cognitive quality, right? Uh, so uh, we are told that he orders good health to exercise, fresh air, teamwork and good sportsmanship. And we also told he wanted to get away from all that and that's the reason why he discovered the hospital. And as we can see uh, throughout the novel, the hospital becomes a very uh, complex site. It becomes a site of uh, you know, security because if you're in a hospital, you don't have to go and fight a battle in, in the front line. But also it becomes a site of subversion where the entire military coercion, the medical military coercion is subverted uh, and also parodied to a certain extent because we have people over here who are pretending or performing uh, madness, performing trauma. As uh, so trauma quite literally becomes a theater of the absurd uh, in this novel. And there is that there is a grotesque uh, absurdist quality which we see in the absurd theaters as well, right? That's very much there as part of the um, part of the aesthetics of representation. So when the physical education officer at Lowry Field ordered everyone to fall out uh, for calisthenics uh, uh, one afternoon, was Rain the private reported instead at the dispensary with what he said was a pain in his right side. So again, the uh, operative word over here. Or the operative uh, phrase over here is what he said. Uh, so this almost seems to be some kind of an agency, um, you know, given uh, to Wesserine. He decides which side um, is hurting today and he reports that and you know, that obviously um, uh, ensures that he goes away from the calisthenics uh, or the gymnastics or the exercise, whatever was decreed. Uh, he instead spends time at the dispensary. Beat it said the officer on duty there who was doing a crossword puzzle. So again, we see an officer on duty there uh, who was more interested in a crossword puzzle. And this is the uh, very unglamorous, boring, uh, tedious representation of ennui, which is characteristic of the war. So instead of the heroic battleground of the war, where we hear people dying and see people kill each other and 
dying glorious heroic deaths. We see the very boring uh, bureaucratic underbelly of the war, which is also grotesque in quality. We have people who come in as mangled bodies, we have people who come in as completely decimated and shattered in the mind. Uh, and yet, you know, there seems to be some kind of a boredom, which seems to be the um, all pervasive sentiments. Everyone's just bored. And um, uh, in the last session, if you remember, we had talked about how the uh, uh, and there seems to be a blurring of borderlines at all levels. So the difference between the patient and the doctor, the patient and the healer, it begins to blur away because the healer or the doctor seems or appears uh, more needy for help on certain occasions. Okay, so the first response of a doctor on duty was ask him to go away, beat it. Uh, we can't tell him to beat it, uh, said a corporal. Um, there's a new directive out about um, uh, uh, abdominal complaints. We have to keep them under observation five days because so many of them have been dying after we make them beat it. So uh, this is exactly what I meant. This is very, very dark humor because we are told that people have been dying because officers on duty at medical uh, sites or medical uh, sections have just asked them to go away. And we are told that many people have died in the last few days. Uh, because, you know, they have been refused any treatment. So, there's a new directive which has come up which uh, orders or decrees that people have to stay uh, under observation for five days if they're complaining of abdominal pain. So, again, very serious medical issue represented in a way which is pseudo-comic in quality. Uh, and this, this pseudo-comicality is interesting for us to observe. All right, grumble the doctor, keep him under observation five days and then make him beat it. They took worse rain clothes away and put him in a ward where he was very happy uh, when no one was snoring nearby. In the morning, a helpful young English intern popped in to ask him about the liver. So again, uh, the liver becomes a metaphor as you can see uh, at the very opening of the novel too. There was this case about John Dees, whether he has John Dees and doesn't have John Dees. So that becomes the, uh, the point of dilemma in the novel, the, the catch-22 situation in a way. Uh, which is almost biological in quality or biologically underpinned. Uh, so this English in turn popped up to discuss his liver. I think it's my appendix that's bothering me, was Rain told him. Your appendix is no good, the Englishman declared with jaunty authority. And this section again becomes very pseudo-comic, it's almost advising him how to malinger, he's advising him how to lie about his condition, how to give up uh, a confused situation before the doctors just so he can stay there forever. And he says the liver seems to be the most confused side, the most confusing organ because you know you can see what it is but you don't know how it functions. So uh, he's advising Worse Rain to stick to the liver in terms of describing his uh, pain. If your appendix goes wrong, we can take it out and have you back on active duty in almost no time at all. So the appendix is not a good uh, excuse me, not a good rationale to not fight the war because if it's an appendix problem, people could just take out the appendix, operate it, and then send it back, um, ampute it, and send it back in the war. But come to us with a liver complaint, and you can fool us for weeks. So this becomes the operative word over here fool us for weeks. Now, uh, the word fool over here seems to take uh, have many connotations, several complex connotations. There is obviously the quality of uh, cheating, malingering, pretending. Uh, but also, there seems to, be, seems to be some kind of a Shakespearean quality about that as well, in the sense that this uh, fool in Shakespeare, as you all know, uh, becomes the performance of deceptive identities, becomes the performance of uh, disguised identities. People pretend to be what they're not. Uh, and, you know, that manufacturing of identities becomes uh, almost metaphorical, as well as performative in the uh, especially in the comedies of Shakespeare. Now, this to the word fool over here seems to have some kind of a similar uh, Shakespearean quality here as well because, you know, he's obviously performing an identity that he is not and that makes him, uh, you know, obviously uh, some kind of a subversive person as well as um, a bit of an anti-hero. And the word anti-hero is interesting over here because it completely undercuts the uh, notional heroic uh, representation of the military man. And so the, the novel emerges as a parody of that kind of heroic masculinity, right? So it, it's in a way it's a very uh, you know subversive parody of that military masculinity because what we have here instead are people who just lie through the teeth and tell everything to get away from the war or to get away from being killed. Okay, and now we have an Englishman, uh, presumably a doctor or presumably you know a soldier, uh, advising. Uh, was in how to lie perfectly or to pick the right organ for lying. The liver, you see, is a large, ugly mystery to us. 
If you've ever eaten liver, you know what I mean. You, you're pretty sure today that the liver exists and we have a fairly good idea of what it does and whatever it's doing, what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, beyond that, we're really in the dark. Now again, there seems to be some uh, pseudo comicality about it because the way the Englishman describes the liver, uh, we don't seem to know anything. We don't seem to need to know anything outside this. We know what it is, we know how it works, we know when it works, we know how it works. And then he says, beyond that, we know nothing. And again, there seems to be some kind of an epigrammatic quality, right? Beyond that, we're really in the dark. After all, what is a liver? My father, for example, died of cancer of the liver and was never sick a day of his life right up to the moment it killed him. I never felt a twinge of pain. In a way, that was too bad since I hated my father. Lust for my mother, you know? So again, there uh, seems to be some kind of... Uh, very, very uh, degenerative wit at play. And this obviously is reflective of a certain kind of mental condition where he says, it's too bad that my father never suffered because I hated him. And then he seems to, you know, suggest that he has some kind of a, a sexual affiliation or sexual uh, longing for his mother. What's an Englishman medical, of what was an English medical officer doing on duty here? Was there wanted to know? The officer laughed. I'll tell you all about that when I see you tomorrow morning and throw the silly ice bag away before you die of pneumonia. Uh, so Wasserine presumably has an ice bag with him and the Englishman is almost guffawing about it. And he says, throw it away before you die of pneumonia and I'll tell you when I meet you tomorrow morning, I'll do my backstory. What am I doing here? And the next sentence again undercuts it logically. Uh, Wasserine never saw him again. This, that was one of the nice things about all the doctors at the hospital. The, he never saw any of them a second time. They, all, they came and went and simply disappeared. So this is a place where no real intimacy can be established. This is a place where no real friendship can be forged because people just come in and go out. This is a mutable, volatile space. And this is a place of death as well, right? People just come, die, or dead people are brought in here. So um, this is a place where borderlines blur away all the time, life and death, friendship and enemy. We don't quite know, you know which side you're in. So it's just a volatile, mutable space. Uh, in place of the English intern the next day, there arrived a group of doctors he had never seen before to ask him about the appendix. Uh, there's nothing wrong with my appendix, it was the way informed them. The doctor yesterday said it was my liver, so he seems to take the suggestion of the Englishman. Maybe it is his liver, replied the white-haired officer in charge. What does his blood count show? He hasn't had a blood count. Have one taken right away. We can't afford to take chances with a patient in his condition. We've got to keep ourselves covered in case he dies. He made a notation on his clipboard and spoke to Wesserain. In the meantime, keep that ice bag on. It's very important. I don't have an ice bag on. Well, get one. There must be an ice bag around here somewhere. I let someone know if the pain becomes unendurable. So, this seems to be some kind of uh, complete consternation and confusion and pandemonium and chaos among the doctors because each one of them seems to give them different advices. The Englishman asks them to get rid of the ice pipe and we have a different um, doctor coming in today, uh, this day, and asking him to put an ice bag on and he says, I don't have an ice bag. And then he says, well, just have one because, you know, it seems to be the panacea to a certain extent. And then he says, you know, if it gets too unbearable, let us know. Now, would that obviously all this obviously shows is the performative quality of sickness uh, or illness, right? So illness and trauma are sort of performed in this novel throughout in a pseudo-comic way. Again, the pseudo-comicality is part of the absurdity, which, as I may have mentioned earlier, is reflective of the, the, the spectacular absurdity characterizing the war. At the end of 10 days, a new group of doctors came to Wasserain with bad news. He was in perfect health and had to get out. So, which this happens to be the bad news uh, given the circumstances that he is in perfect health and has to go out, which means he has to be back on the war front. He was rescued in the nick of time by a patient across the aisle who began to see everything twice. Without warning, the patient sat up in the bed and shouted, I see everything twice. So this is the character um, in, in question over here out of which uh, the uh, chapter is titled and the soldier saw everything twice. So just when he was about to be dismissed, from the hospital, uh, the entire attention focus uh, was shifted uh, to this other person, other soldier who seemed to see everything twice. A nurse screamed and, and audibly fainted. Doctors came running up from every direction with needles, lights, tubes, rubber mallets, and oscillating metal tines. 
they rolled up complicated instruments and wheels. There's not enough for the patient to go around, and the specialist pushed forward in line with raw tempers and snapped at the colleagues in front to hurry up and give someone somebody else a chance. A colonel with a large forehead and horn-rimmed glasses soon arrived at a diagnosis. It's meningitis, he called it emphatically, waving the others back. Well, the Lord knows there is not the slightest reason for thinking so. Then why pick meningitis? inquired a major with a swerve chuckle. Why not? Let's say acute uh, nephritis. So again, we see they're playing with classification over here. They don't have any uh, idea or any classification or any real knowledge about what the condition really is, and they're just bantering with some terms, which again shows a complete, the utter chaos of the medical theory, the medical knowledge in the face of a real war, uh, which again uh, de-glamorizes military medicine and gives us perhaps a, a true gritty dark picture of what really goes on in the, the bureaucratic underbelly during the war, where even uh, the best of the infrastructure, the best of the forces, uh, seem to suffer from this chaos, from this cognitive dissonance, where doctors don't have any uh, any knowledge of what the real symptom is, they just invent names to classify patients uh, with. Okay, so meningitis, and someone says acute nephritis, and both know they are completely in the dark about it. And then you know, the person who says, uh, wants to stick to meningitis says, oh, because I am a meningitis man, uh, I am a specialist in that, that's why I'm choosing to classify him as a meningitis patient, uh, and I'm ascribing the, the double vision that he has to meningitis. Because I'm a meningitis man, that's why I'm not an acute uh, nephritis man, retorted the colonel, I'm not going to give up uh, to any of your kidney birds without a struggle, I was here first. So, this is very, very dark uh, humorous uh, because, you know, the doctors with different specializations are crowded around this patient and it almost becomes uh, finders, keepers of first come, first, come, first serve. Uh, the first person who been here says, you know, he has to have a problem, uh, a nosological condition. is just giving a nosological category, a classification, medical classification based on his own expertise because he was there first. So he will claim the person and in a process uh, get some visibility in that military ward. In the end, all the doctors were all in accord. They agreed that they had no idea what was wrong with the soldier who saw everything twice, and they rolled him away to into a room in the corridor and quarantined everyone else in a ward for 14 days. So again, uh, they all agreed that they have no idea, this complete chaos about the condition of the patient, and they all you know, rolled him away to a different ward, and everyone else who had been in contact with this person was quarantined for 14 days. Thanksgiving Day um, came and went without any fuss while Wasserine was still in the hospital. The only bad thing about it was the turkey for dinner, and even that was pretty good, right? So, you know, again, we're playing with adjectives, playing with uh, epithets over here. The turkey was bad, you know, the only bad thing was the turkey for dinner and Thanksgiving, and even that was good. So, again, we're talking about the hospital in very uh, festive terms. It was the most rational Thanksgiving he had ever spent, and it took a sacred oath to spend every future Thanksgiving uh, in a cloistered shelter of a hospital, right? So, the hospital seems to be the, uh, the best place, the most luxurious place, the most indulgent place uh, for someone of his condition. Uh, he broke his sacred oath the very next year when he spent the holiday in a hotel room, instead of an intellectual conversation with Lieutenant uh, Shiskov's wife who had uh, Dory Dozer's dog tax on for the occasion and who handpecked Wasserine sententiously for being cynical and callous about Thanksgiving, even though she didn't believe in God just as much as he didn't, right? So, he seems to have some kind of affair with someone's wife. Uh, so, again, it takes a sacred oath uh, about spending Thanksgiving uh, in hospitals and the very next year spends in a hotel with someone's wife, uh, Lieutenant uh, Sheskov's wife, uh, and it seems to be having an affair together. Uh, and so, this whole thing is a de -sacralize. Now, this is the interesting bit in the novel that I want to spend a little bit of time with, and that is nothing in this novel is sacred, and uh, nothing uh, in this novel is uh, immutable uh, or set in stone or permanent, and impermanent seems to be the only permanent condition uh, in this novel. Human relationships are not permanent, human spaces are not permanent, human sentiments are not permanent, uh, human cognitive conditions are not permanent. So, mutability almost Volatility becomes the only constant condition uh, in this novel, uh, which makes obviously the traumatic condition extremely intense in quality. Uh, and because of this volatility, you don't really have the time to dwell 
on a particular traumatic condition. So unlike Septimus Smith, uh, who dwells on his condition, you know, and he has this melancholia, which is fixated in quality, these people are so bombarded by trauma, literally as well as metaphorically, that they have to keep move, moving on. And every day is a new traumatic uh, condition for them, which makes them uh, do things which are uh, utterly chaotic in quality. Uh, in the process, nothing is set in stone, nothing is immutable, nothing is permanent, nothing is sacred in a universe like this and, and Cash 22. Okay, so, um, um, and now this condition about God comes up again, and we talked about how uh, there seems to be a godless quality in a novel, and by godless I mean centerless quality. There doesn't seem to be uh, any faith system available, any faith system left, or any centricity left. Uh, it's just a completely decentered novel, right? Uh, there's no belief system, there's no faith system, there's no ontological difference between the friend and the enemy, between the healer and the patient, between the good person and the evil person. And this uh, centerlessness, uh, which sometimes manifests itself in pseudo-comic ways or tragic-comic ways, informs the quote-unquote godless quality in a novel, right? There's just absolutely no rationale for what is happening, right? And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the session, there seems to be some very, very serious medical condition, uh, some very acute medical, psychological, cognitive condition, which are being mocked at, which are being laughed at, which are being completely misunderstood, right? So the only form of communication in the novel is miscommunication, the only form of understanding can happen through misunderstanding. So there's this um, conversation with, uh, uh, you know, this woman and was rain. And again, they're talking about God. Uh, this is Lieutenant uh, Sheskov's wife with whom he seems to be having some kind of amorous exchange, which quickly, um, you know, translates or switches over into an exchange about God. Again, which is to show that there's no divine order, there's no holy or sacred order. Everything is just debased. Everything is profaned. Uh, in this novel, which is entirely about uh, the decimation of the human condition or the disintegration of human belief system, which is what is wrought by the war. The real trauma of war is the disintegration of values, which then manifests itself in pseudo-comic, uh, you know, structures. So, this is exchange which should be on the screen. Uh, and don't tell me God walks in mysterious ways. Uh, was the continued? hurtling on over objection. There's nothing so mysterious about it. He's not working at all, right? So again, uh, the way to talk about God over here becomes quite uh, profane, you know, and almost sacrilegious in quality. In a way, it's a very anti-Christian novel. He's playing, or else he's forgotten all about us. Uh, that's the kind of God you people talk about, a country bumpkin, a clumsy, bungling, brainless, conceited, uncouth, uh, hayseed, Good God, how much reverence can you have for a supreme being who finds it necessary to include such phenomena as phlegm and tooth decay in its divine system of creation? What, is, what in the world was running through that warped, evil, scatological mind of his when he robbed all people of the power to control their bowel movements? Why in the world did he ever create pain, right? So, this seems to be not just an atheist condition, but an anti-theist condition or an anti-theist position. Uh, he's, he's talking about the, you know, the pain, the human suffering, and he's asking, this is actually a sort of profound question that Wasserin is trying to convey, obviously disguised through different kinds of uh, pseudo-comic signifiers, uh, which are also scatological in quality. But the question is asking is, if there is a divine design that people believe in or subscribe to, uh, why is pain such a big part of that design? And he says it from someone, as someone, uh, who undergoes pain at a daily level as a veteran of the war, right? So that becomes uh, almost a carnivalesque question, a subversive question. Pain, uh, Lieutenant uh, Sheskov's wife pounds above the word victoriously. Pain is a useful symptom. Pain is a warning to us of bodily dangers. And who created the dangers? Was there in demand? He laughed uh, caustically, and caustic is a very important quality of this uh, culture of uh, comicality, where it's very caustic comicality. He laughed caustically. Oh, he was really being charitable to us when he gave us pain. Why couldn't he have used a doorbell instead to notify us of one of his celestial choirs, or a system of blue and red neon tubes right in the middle of each person's forehead, and a jewel box manufactured worth his soul to could have done that? Why couldn't he? People would certainly look silly walking around with red neon tubes in the middle of their foreheads. Uh, 
they certainly look beautiful now, rhythm and agony or stupefied with morphine, don't they? What a colossal, immortal blunderer. Now, you find there's a very interesting play between matter and metaphor over here, because Lieutenant uh, Shesko's wife uh, takes Wasserin's point literally, you know, and Wasserin is saying, uh, you know, instead of uh, pain acting as a signal for imminent danger, uh, why couldn't have something more ridiculous like, you know, a jukebox or a neon tube in the forehead, which is obviously meant to be a joke, it's meant to be a metaphor, uh, but uh, Lieutenant uh, Shiskov's wife takes it literally and says people look silly, so that's why God designed it differently. And it wasn't really comes back to the fundamental question of pain, and he says that, you know, they look beautiful now and agony, or stupefied with morphine, right? And again, this is the a fundamental irony which informs the narrative instrument uh, in the novel, which is extremely profoundly and ontologically ironical. This is an ironical universe. This is a carnivalesque universe, where the difference between laughter and suffering, between crying and, you know, uh, laughing are just, just blurred, right? So there's no distinction between happiness and sorrow, between laughter and um, uh, crying, between acquirement, but in fulfillment and loss, but in presence and absence, all these borderlines are blurred away in this heavily bombarded uh, world. Right. Um, and then, of course, the anti-theistic condition continues. Uh, and again, there seems to be some kind of uh, King Lear-ish quality, if you think about it. And I mentioned the Shakespeare and Fool a little while ago. If you read King Lear, uh, towards the end of the novel, that too seems to have some very, very uh, fundamental questions about the uh, ontology of theism, the rationale of a theistic universe, right? There was being constantly questioned in that drama as well, which is also a very grotesque drama of human suffering and pain, and uh, which too has a fool. So we have uh, a similar sentiment at play here as well. So, and this obviously reflects the fact that uh, some very serious dark questions uh, are disguised through comedy. Uh, in this novel, right? So we have very, very fundamental questions about the rationale of the war, the rationale of suffering, the rationale of human agony, uh, you know, asked in very flippant ways, but in two people who are presumably having an amorous exchange. Okay, uh, when you consider the opportunity and power he had to really do a job, and then look at the stupid, ugly mess he made of it instead, his sheer incompetence is almost staggering. It's obvious he's never met a payroll. Why, no self-respecting businessman would hire a bungler like him as even a shipping clerk, right? So again, uh, so the metaphysical divine design has been talked about in very, very profane sacrilegious terms, which, and sacrilege seems to be the sentiment in this novel. Okay, so Lieutenant Shetskov's wife had turned ashen and disbelief and was ogling him with alarm. You better not talk, about, talk that way about him, honey. She warned him reprovingly in a low and hostile voice, he might punish you. Uh, and then Wasserman's response again is quasi-philosophical, uh, where he says that, isn't it punishing me enough? Wasserman snorted resentfully, you know, we mustn't let him get away with it. Uh, oh, we certainly mustn't let him get away scot-free for all the sorrow he's caused us. Someday I'm going to make him pay. I know when, on the judgment day, that's the day I'll be close enough to reach out and grab the little yokel by his neck and stop it. Stop it! Uh, Lefner was uh, Shesko's wife screamed suddenly and began beating him ineffectually about the head with both fists. Stop it! So this is obviously um, sacrilege in Christian terms, where he's turning the uh, ontology and the uh, functionality of judgment head upside down. Where instead of God judging the human, he's supposed to judge God. In that day, said, "I'm going to grab him and I'm going to attack him, physically attack him." And that obviously is a sacrilegious thing to say, and uh, uh, left in his course, why uh, retorts uh, hysterically and asks him to sh stop it and starts beating him, um, you know, ineffectually. Wasserain uh, ducked behind his arm for protection while she slammed away at him in feminine fury for a few seconds, and then he caught her determinedly by the wrist and forced her gently back down on the bed. What the hell are you getting so upset about? He asked her bewilderedly in a tone of contrad amusement. I thought you didn't believe in God. I don't. She sobbed, bursting violently into tears. But the God I don't believe in is a good God, a just God, a merciful God. He's not a mean and stupid God you make him out to be. And again, this is a very post-modernist thing. Uh, uh, she believes in some kind of an absence. Uh, again, this 
completely blurs the borderline between absence and presence. I mean, she acknowledges the fact that she doesn't believe in a God. And then she goes on to say, the God that I don't believe in is a just God. The God I don't believe in, the God I disbelieve in is a rational God, which makes the entire logical structure quite complex in quality, right? And there's some kind of a partial presence that God has in her disbelief as well. So again, disbelief is not a rejection of belief. Disbelief becomes a continuation of a belief system in this very postmodernist, post-structuralist world. So she doesn't believe in a God, but the God that she doesn't believe in uh, is a rational God, is a just God, right? So that again, uh, it generates a very complex uh, ontological play between presence and absence, between faith and faithlessness, right? So these bodlines uh, blur it, they get entangled together, right? What's very really loved, uh, and this again is part of the production and consumption of paradoxes which run across the novel. What's really loved and turn her arms loose? Let's have a little more religious freedom between us. He prepares uh, obligingly. You don't believe in the God you want to, and I won't believe in the God I want to. Is that a deal? So this is a half chopped logic and again that half chopped logical structure uh, appropriates everything right so nothing is sacred nothing is a metaphysical in this novel everything can be consumed by half logic everything can be consumed by quasi logic because quasi logic is the only logic left in this world uh, that was the most illogical thanksgiving he could ever remember spending and his thoughts were turned wishfully to his uh, uh, Halcyon 14 day quarantine in the hospital the year before, but even that ideal had ended on a tragic note. So, this is a jump cut, and you know, he sort of thought about what happened the next year, and then he you know, narrative comes back to the present day where he's in the hospital and he's surrounded by someone, uh, by a soldier who seems to say everything twice. He was still in good health when the quarantine period was over. And they told him again he had to get out and go to the war. Wasserine sat up on the bed when he heard the bad news and shouted, I see everything twice. Right? So, you know, this seems to be infectious, and he's obviously performing that uh, madness, performing that illusion. So, illusion, uh, disease, illness, these become, as I mentioned, quite performative, rather performative categories. So, just like the earlier soldier had created a lot of chaos. Uh, by claiming to see everything twice. Wasserine thought this is an easy way uh, to trick people. So again, he becomes a trickster, uh, malingerer uh, soldier, and he says, you know, I see everything twice. So uh, he's obviously a rogue uh, anti-hero over here, and he's just trying to do his best to perform illness in a way which will make him fixated in that uh, hospital, which is the safest place for him at that point of time. So pandemonium broke loose in the ward again. The specialists came running from all directions and reined him in a circle of scrutiny, so confining that he could feel the humid breath from the various noses blowing uncomfortably uh, upon the different sectors of his body. They went snooping into his eyes and ears with tiny beams of light, assaulted his legs and favorite rubber hammers and vibrating forks, and drew blood from his veins, held anything handy up for him to see on the periphery of his vision, right? So he's surrounded by uh, people and doctors. The leader of his team of doctors was a dignified, solicitous gentleman who held one finger up directly in front of Wasserin and demanded, How many fingers do you see? Two, said Wasserin. How many fingers do you see now? asked the doctor, holding up two. Two, said Wasserin. How many now? asked the doctor, holding up none. Two, uh, said Wasserin. The doctor's uh, face writhed with a smile. By Jove, he's right, he declared jubilantly. He does see everything twice. Right, sir. So, uh, it's almost become some kind of a uh, mathematical medical play uh, to confirm his illness and obviously has a, a pseudo comic quality to it. And the doctor seems to be congratulating himself for having diagnosed the disease. They all were away on a stretcher into the, into the room with the other soldier who saw everything twice and quarantined everyone else in the ward for another 14 days. I see everything twice. The, ho the soldier who saw everything twice shouted when they rolled Wasserin in. I see everything twice. Wasserin shouted back at him just as loudly with a secret wink. The walls, the walls, the other soldier cried, move back the walls. The walls, the walls, Wasserin cried, move back the walls. One of the doctors pretended to show the wall back. He said, far enough. So you can see this is an abs entirely absurdist spectacle. We don't know if one of the two people over here is actually having an optical illusion. But we know for sure that the Wasserin doesn't, and the doctors are pretending to cater or 
respond to the optical illusion by making tangible things move, pretending, right? So, the entire room becomes an absurd theater of sorts. Uh, the soldier who saw everything uh, uh, twice nodded weakly and sank back on his bed. Wasserain nodded weakly too, eyeing his talented roommate with great humility and admiration. He knew he was in presence of a master. His talented roommate was obviously a person to be studied and emulated. During the night, he, uh, his talented roommate died, and Wasserain decided that he had followed him far enough. I see everything once, he cried weakly. He cried quickly. A new group of specialists came pounding up at his bedside and the instruments to find out if this was true. So, again, this very close uh, proximity to death is something which characterizes this pseudo comic quality. Because the other person who had been brought in obviously had a very, very serious medical condition. Uh, we are told that he died that very night. And Wolfsrain um, uh, decided to emulate him, admire him, pick up tricks from him. And the moment the other person died, Wolfsrain decided that he's going to cure himself as well. Right? And then he declared, I see everything once. They cried, he cried quickly. And a new group of specialists come in. How many fingers uh, asked the leader holding up one? One. The doctor held up two fingers. How many fingers do you see now? One. The doctor held up ten fingers. And how many now? One. The doctor uh, turned to uh, the other doctors with amazement. He does see everything once. He exclaimed, we made him all better. Right. So I'm going to stop at this point today. And you can see this becomes a complete caricature of military medicine, but also is a reflection of the entire uh, cluelessness of military medicine to the, you know, about the real mental health of the soldiers. And the doctors over here, they obviously appear as parodic caricature representations. But the more serious representation here, the more serious message that is there, the very dark, serious message over here is the complete helplessness of the doctors as well as the patients. The doctors have no idea and they just try some mathematical formula to address the patients, which obviously don't, doesn't work because the real sufferers die and a complete helplessness, complete lack of treatment, complete lack of aid or help, right? And that becomes the normative condition over here. So, Wasserain's caricature, Wasserain's parody uh, becomes a very grotesque mimicry of the real mental condition, the mimicry of the real horrendous human suffering that characterizes the war and the utter inability of the military medicine or the medical science around that time to address those uh, at any level, medically or a level of empathy or human understanding, you know, is a complete failure, a complete crisis of the medical practice around that time. So, which becomes a very uh, serious and sinister and dark representation of human helplessness around that time, which is again a reflective of the godless, centerless quality, which you also see in some absurdist theatre and also sometimes in Shakespeare plays such as King Lear. So, I'll stop at this point today. We'll continue with this and we'll wind up this uh, uh, novel in another couple of sessions. So, now, thank you for your attention.